Hi, I'm Chris Roselli. And I'm Anna Magidson. Welcome to Western Window, a show made for you by students at Western Washington University. This time, we'll discuss the value of having a really solid zombie plan. We'll explore the local effects of the tsunami in Japan. We'll find out more about the extended education summer program for kids, as well as the importance of the law, diversity, and justice program at Fairhaven. So stay with us as we explore our world through Western Window. This season, local beach visitors might expect to see some interesting things washed up on our shores. A recent grant is helping Western's Rebecca Green with the work of organizing data and tracking changes in debris. Community members, including the North Sound Baykeepers, are helping to get a handle on the local effects of the recent tsunami in Japan. My grandma used to do a cleanup on the Olympic coast uh, back in the 70s uh, when she was about that age in her 70s. And so I thought I would start signing up for that and start kind of keep the tradition, tradition alive. There's always been a lot of styrofoam. Uh, sometimes you see a lot of tires, a lot of the buoys, the styrofoam buoys, water bottles and plastic bottles. We're in Olympic National Park. Right in front of me is Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. We believe we're seeing woody debris, and we believe it's from Japan just uh, from the size of it and then from the cuts in the wood and in how it's joined together. They use techniques in Japan that are not common to the United States. Something else I came across just recently this winter, grounded just a few miles to the south of us, was a 188-ton dock from the city of Misawa, Japan. And this is the same type of dock that washed up last summer in Agate Beach in Oregon. Washington State and most of the west coast of the United States has a program of community-based cleanups. So we have three sources of information primarily for the amount of debris that we can use to potentially track through time and in space where debris makes landfall in Washington. One is information derived from beach cleanups like this one in which volunteers are collecting data as they're picking up trash so, and that's primarily numbers so they're tracking uh, numbers of uh, bottles and floats and, and what have you. And the other one associated with cleanups is that all the dumpsters get weighed when they're dumped at the landfill. And then the final source of information that we're turning to are monitoring programs. So yesterday I was in charge of organizing myself and volunteers um, to process the data that the Coast Saver volunteers picked up. Weighing the debris, seeing how well they guessed the weights, separating it into different piles hygiene items, items from shoreline activity, tobacco habits, and that sort of thing. And then within each of those categories, we broke it down as to whether we thought it was from short-range sources, North American, or whether it was from long-range sources, Asian, or if we could identify it as Japanese. What we think is happening is that the debris is making its way across the ocean. We know that some is making landfall on the Washington coast, but much of it is being diverted either north or south uh, in currents that run along the coast of North America. The majority of debris that is picked up is local. It's not coming from other countries. It's coming from most likely Washington state. The marine debris does not recognize international boundaries. Debris that we put in the water 
in the United States ends up elsewhere in the world. The debris that others put into the water elsewhere ends up here. So we're sharing this, we're sharing this debris around the world. I think that you have to be careful about how much garbage you just have hanging around that can blow into the water. It's really important to realize that uh, we have a huge issue planet-wide with marine debris. The only effective thing to do is to keep it out of the water. The Law, Diversity and Justice program here at Western examines how race, class, gender, sexual orientation and disability intersect with the legal system. It's a unique opportunity for students to dig deeper into intense issues of society and fairness before heading off to law school and other careers in social justice work. I'm here today with Julie Helling, who is a professor at Fairhaven College and the director of the Law, Diversity and Justice program. It's a pleasure having you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So could you tell us some, some more about the Law, Diversity and Justice program? Sure. Um, I have been here since the year 2000, but it actually started first as the Law, Diversity, Law and Diversity program back mm -hmm. in 1991. So it's been around for quite a while. The purpose of the program is to talk about the law, the legal system, and to also talk about social justice. I mean, that's why we have the words diversity and justice in there. Mm -hmm. And we want to not only say this is how the law works, but we want to critique the law and we want to look at how should the law work and, and ask that question, you know, just consistently throughout our mm -hmm. courses. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So what are some things that the program actually does? Well, we do a lot of things. Um, we have a required curriculum, uh, obviously, and, and in those required courses we teach about uh, the American legal system, and we also teach about international law. We have a professor, uh, Baba Femi Akin Renate, who's an expert in international law, so students can learn about both the American legal system now and international human rights, for example. Um, another thing that we often do is mock trials, where we have the students serving as, you know, attorneys for the case. And I, in fact, taught a whole course on trial skills last year where we did the, the final uh, case was tried in front of a mock jury at the Whatcom County Courthouse. And there was actual judges that were serving as the judges for the mock trial. So those kinds of experiences, um, you know, they're not easy to get at that level of intensity. And so that's one of the things that I'm really proud we're able to offer. Got it. So yeah, it seems like there's a very big um, chance for students to go in the community, into Be the Bellingham community, and essentially give back right after they, you know, finish the program or even during it. Uh, do you guys have a lot of internships that go through Bellingham or the Seattle area? We we absolutely do, and you're and you're right. The people can do it right after the program or mm -hmm. during the program in in internship situations. Julie, why is this program important? because these are absolutely universal issues. It's everybody's responsibility and everyone's equally responsible to deal with issues of race and social justice and gender and disability and sexual orientation, all of those things, because it affects all of us. And we can pretend it doesn't affect us, but it does. And it's usually the people in power who have privilege who are able to say, oh, maybe this doesn't affect me, I don't need to know about it, but in fact, it does touch everybody, and if you believe in justice, and I think most people will say anyway that they you know, hope for a just society, it's critical to know about these issues. This is my dream job, and I, it still is. I mean, I'm just so lucky to be part of it and to work with, I mean, our faculty, the whole Fairhaven faculty is amazing, but you know, the, some of the professors that teach in the Law, Diversity and Justice curriculum include Professor Raquel Montoya Lewis, who is not only a professor in the Law and Div Diversity and Justice curriculum, but she's the chief judge out of the Nooksack Tribal Court. So that, that uh, you know, degree of experience and knowledge about federal Indian law and the entire American legal system from, you know, daily experience of being on the bench as a judge mm -hmm. is invaluable for our students. Um, 
you know, Professor Baba Femiak and Renate, who's an expert in international law and, you know, uh, offers courses on things like genocide mm -hmm. and, um, you know, really important uh, global subjects. Okay. Uh, and then we have uh, Professor Dan Larner, you know, who's very active in the American Civil Liberties Union and, and a real advocate of civil liberties, mm -hmm. uh, as well as a professor in, in the humanities at Fairhaven. I mean, it just, uh, you know, we're really lucky. Yes, I have a very good team. Yeah. Well, Thank you. The LEAD framework, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, is the primary rating system for green buildings in the United States, and it ensures that buildings use only what they need to decrease carbon emissions and costs. Western's commitment to sustainability has made the campus a leader in LEAD. Western Washington University is one of many college campuses across the country joining the green building movement. Nationwide, over 100 colleges have built or are building LEED certified buildings. LEED is the most well-known and most frequently used green building rating system. The program encourages green building strategies by awarding construction projects various levels of LEED certification. I'm a project manager, I've been an architect, a licensed architect in the state and have been a project manager with Western for uh, a little over 18 years. Uh, my first lead project was Miller Hall, the renovation of Miller Hall. I was here on site when AIC West was constructed. It was, it was really a, a pretty exciting project and uh, lead being part of that made it even more with any LEED project, there is a, there is a, a, a checklist that LEED has uh, that, they, that, that you get points for. And based on the number of items on that checklist that you're successful with, you get a point for each one, each item. And uh, some of the items are prerequisites, things that you have to do if you want a LEED building. And then there are others that you try to achieve. And obviously the more you achieve, the higher the LEED rating goes. Platinum is the highest level, then gold, then silver, and then bronze, and then lead. To achieve lead silver, a building must earn a certain number of points in categories that consider sustainable building sites, water and energy efficiency, use of recycled materials and renewable resources, indoor air quality, and innovation in design. Achieving a high level of, of lead certification uh, is not just important for uh, the, the planet and the people working in that building, but it's also a cost-saving measure. So we're looking long-term at how what our utility outlay is going to be for a building. We should be investing uh, more money now to save us more money in the long run. Western's campus has three lead buildings, Miller Hall, the Rec Center, and the AIC. There were lead um, characteristics in the, in the building, in the design that we already had, uh, but it wasn't required yet. It wasn't a legal requirement in the state of Washington. And we decided partway into the design in approaching construction to pursue the lead certification. And that, the impetus for that came from you. It came from the student body. They wanted to see that um, that AIC followed um, lead practices and, and received lead certification. Uh, we have you know we have buildings on campus that were built literally in the 1800s, all the way to buildings that have been built or renovated in the 2000s. So we have a whole variety of buildings in various stages of efficiency or lack of efficiency, and that Western does. When, whenever the opportunity comes up, they, they do their best to, to advance LEED standards and, and uh, make the buildings uh, better. I like the fact that it still looks like Miller Hall. We, we, we were able to do all these wonderful things to the building and sort of bring it into the 21st century and not really change the, over, the underlying character of the building. It's tens of thousand dollars a month that we, that we don't spend on the new Miller Hall that we spent on the old Miller Hall for utilities alone. I 
think at a university, the biggest benefit is demonstrating to our future builders and designers and even doctors and teachers what a building that's built with the future in mind looks like. And that, I think that's the biggest benefit of pushing that lead envelope, and pushing that green building envelope on a university campus. It's a real life, 3D, real world example of the power that you have as students to help um, back to, to that mission statement of the U.S. Green Building Council to transform, you know, the building and community design and construction process. And when you're feeling good about the environment you're in, it helps you to feel better about yourself. It's going to improve productivity for the people that work here. It's going to improve our students' learning process. And having a healthier, better quality environment is going to improve the health and quality of our lives. Do you have a zombie plan? Will you be able to survive the dreadful, creeping doom of the undead? Will members of Western's Humans vs. Zombies Club practice their survival skills to see how long they can remain human before the clock runs out? <laughs> Sorry. This was actually the original reason I put Western as one of my options when I applied to colleges. My friend was like, oh, I'm playing Humans vs. Zombies. And I was like, what is that? Versus Zombies is essentially a glorified game of tag, like a nerf war all over campus. And I thought it was awesome. I would explain it as um, basically an augmented reality game because there's there's a, a real life component of it, uh, and then there's also this whole back end stuff. The zombies are trying to tag the humans, and when the humans tag, they turn into a zombie. You are a human to be in with, or you're an OZ, original zombie, and. Your goal is to survive. It's more than just a crazy game of tag. That's what people forget about it. There's a story that lasts a full week. People get really involved. People track other people's progress and failures and successes. It's a spectator sport. People watch each other. People who don't play love watching us run around and play with toys. There's many tactical things you can do as a human. You can camp inside your dorm room for a week. You can run up and down campus and try and kill as many zombies as you can. Freshmen usually do that and they usually die. The armbands that I'm wearing, first off the green is to designate that I'm an uh, in-game official. The orange on the other hand, that is issued to every player. And the orange around the arm indicates you're a human, and if you have your orange band tied around your head, that indicates you are a zombie. You know, it's fun when the game's going on, you see the people with the, the shoulder bands, you know they're still alive, and I often say, hey, keep your head down, or do you know about this exit around this building? The game's really cinematic. People. Forget about that, but there's a lot more that goes into it than just running around and trying to stay safe. I think it's important to understand that this is something that was created by students, for students, for students to participate in. I know that John and some of the early progenitors of the game did a lot of due diligence to work with UPD and, and Faculty Senate and the institutions uh, of, of power and control for the university so that it could work within the context of the university and so everybody was on the, on the same level. But the big, the big thing is that it's, it's a huge community. People that I met here have been my best friends, my worst enemies, but at the end of the day, we're all people who just want to hang out, have fun, run around, and enjoy you know, this beautiful campus. I think the way technology changes and the way that student populations changes and how a university interacts with those, those developments and, and that sort of awesome frontier of cool uh, is important to keep an open mind. I love the game because it is, it's a game of victories for both sides. For the humans, if you get to your destination, it, you feel so good to be alive. And when you survive the day, you feel even better because you know you can get to the next day. I think it's, in, in aggregate, important for our students to experience these sort of like quirky experiences of life. It was a great opportunity to meet people. At freshman year, friend base, just grew exponentially. Humans vs. Zombies to me 
is just this amazing game that brings everyone together. You just meet awesome people all the time, and it's great. I think it's really awesome because it's part of a, kind of a college experience for a, a student. Because, I mean, college is just kind of like your one-shot opportunity, at least, you know, societally speaking, to be a little different, a little out there. But to me, HBZ, the community itself, means a lot. Um, it's a place where I can be the weird person that I am and know that everybody else is just as weird. In fact, today, I had found a box down in the basement in Bond, and I decided to become a box person. <laughs> and so I put the box over my head and started running with my blaster through Red Square. And whenever somebody looked at me, I would go down in the box. Get this really unique opportunity to take people, you know, fresh out of high school, or maybe, maybe even earlier than that. And they're like, I have no idea what I want to do with my life. And hey, come to college. Here's all these options and all these things that you can do, and you can find yourself and find what you like for your career, and, and all these sorts of things in between. And that's really what the university is supposed to be about. We have this player. His name is Kevin, but he's known as Ninja. You, you won't find him, so don't try looking. He met up in the middle of Red Square, and we had 20 zombies surrounding him. And he gets one dart per zombie, and he takes out zombies. Just 20, 19, 18, 17, I'm slowly getting down. And it comes down to the final, me versus him. Top human, top zombie. He's got one shot left. He puts his blaster down, and we hug. It's the way to end a day. That's the great thing about HVZ is that you can do things that you never thought possible. I mean, it, it's exploded into something that's completely cool and very crazy, uh, and in a way, uniquely Western, because it, it kind of it kind of jives with what we do here. Uh, and so I think that's that's really important to support, so, so things like that. It's something that students created, and, and that's awesome. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be here for. So why should schools like Western have HVZ? Because, because it's, it's awesome! awesome. Um, Who did you want to be as a little kid? An astronaut? A chef? A marine biologist? Here at Western, the Summer Odyssey program allows elementary and middle school kids to learn more about all sorts of fields, ranging from astronomy to art to film. One of our staple programs has been the Odyssey of Science and Arts, which was established in 1982 brings young folks to campus to learn the sciences and the arts in a more in-depth, experiential learning environment. In, in Whatcom County, what makes the program unique is the students get a four hour a day, more in-depth exposure to one topic for the week. So they get a, a lot of good hands-on experience, um, which, which sometimes in school is, isn't uh, available to them. 99% of our teachers are either faculty here at Western or they are alumni um, of our Woodring College of Education program and are out in the public schools right now teaching. Um, we are building an awesome car that is supposed to transport a sandwich, but we don't have a sandwich so we're probably just going to make this like, I don't know, fake sandwich or something. This class is Wild Interactions and Energy, and today uh, the kids are working on their first day of Rube Goldberg projects. So by tomorrow, they will have constructed machines that are very complex, that use energy transfers to do something very, very simple. In their case, to set an alarm to wake up a student. So all of these things are for that final product. And we'll light this candle, then we'll send it down here. We're burning this string, releasing this weight. This ruler will be up here. Uh, releasing the pulley. Going down here, knocking out those dominoes. And uh, so far, yeah. still work in progress though. Yeah. This year we expanded to three weeks, and I think we'll probably keep it at that for a while. Um, we talk about maybe incorporating um, a session for high school students and, and doing some uh, more advanced types of classes for them. 
This summer, I had students from South Korea through an exchange program and a ton of local students, both elementary and middle school. And in this class, we explore the design process from solving a problem to learning about materials, making a plan, and then finally building a model, testing it, and making it better. In order to do this, we build a number of different things in this class. We have started out by building a marble track where students used only straws, index cards, and clay to build a track with 90 degree angles and the highest starting height that they could come up with. And then we finish off the week with a final project of students' choice where they can choose to build anything powered by motors, um, wood-based construction, I have a couple of students exploring electricity and light bulbs and creative ways to mount a light on your body. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jonathan and this is um, the Robotics 101 class. And what I have here is, it was a lawnmower but I turned it into a car and you can control it on a phone. Well, my favorite part of this camp was actually working with people who had lots of experience with this camp and getting to use the tools that I've never used before. I've never done anything like this before. Nothing with cameras, so it was nice getting to learn how to use cameras and edit stuff. My favorite part of the film class was probably getting to brainstorm what we wanted to film and having a wide range of options for it. Um, I'm Olin and uh, I'm doing robotics and um, I made this robot here that I really, I think it's really cool, and it's just an arm that can move and it kind of clamp onto stuff. Never really done anything like this before, and I thought it was really awesome. I really like the Odyssey program. I like that it gives it a chance to go to a camp, but still be able to take classes other than just sport stuff. I think my favorite part was just filming the movie and being out there actually doing it and then messing up and then we get to laugh over all of them later. That wraps up this episode of Western Window. Be sure to tune in next time to explore the world at and around Western Washington University.